coming up on the end of this series of lessons. It's not every every book since we've done the six six month books. It's I think this is probably one of the very few that we've had that the uh, set of lessons actually flows through the entire twenty six weeks of the six months. So <laughs> we're wrapping up this uh, series on the Book of Romans. Got two more lessons, this one one more. This is the times and the fullness of the Gentiles. Now, while the Jewish nation was rejected, individuals have been a part of the church from the beginning. The 12 apostles were all Jews, as were the 120 on the day of Pentecost. The church was a fully Jewish institution until Peter went to the house of Cornelius, the Roman centurion, and all of his family and friends were saved. Since that time, the church has become an increasingly Gentile majority. Jews are still being saved, yet the nation of Israel remains blind to the truth of their own Messiah. Jew, um, sorry, although the times of the Gentiles are still upon us, this does not guarantee anyone a seat around the throne of God. We are each required to acknowledge our own weaknesses and surrender them to God. In the commentary, in Romans 11, 18 through 22, the Apostle Paul admonishes the Gentiles not to be boastful and high-minded. He warns them against the same spirit of unbelief which had caused Israel's fall. Unbelief is a, is a heart problem spiritually. The head may know full well that salvation is by grace through faith alone, and that the tongue may even recite the Scriptures which so declare it. But true belief unto salvation is a heart conviction which gives proof of understanding the true intent of the gospel message. Israel had made themselves sinners by their unbelief in Christ and the gospel. Their unbelief resulted in God's rejection of them. However, individuals could be saved on the grounds of repentance and belief. <clears throat> the context of a Romans 11, 18 through 22 declares that vain boasting belies true belief in God's grace as sufficient to save, and prideful high-mindedness denies a heart understanding of the grace and mercy of God. Paul there, therefore advocates fear, a humble, awesome, appreciative fear of God, a fear lest the cunning subtlety of Satan take advantage of our knowledge of God's truth and turn it into vainglorious pride. And God is no respecter of persons. Speaking of the Jews and Gentiles through analogy, we read in Romans 11, 24, through 25, 24 and 25, For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, we would all do well to understand how this particular passage of Scripture applies to us today. Yes, we have an understanding of God's Word, but simply knowing the truth and actually allowing God to live out that truth through our lives are two very different things. How can we know the difference? God has given us His Word. Do our lives reflect the attitudes and actions of Jesus? If so, we're moving in the right direction. Or are, are our lives more representative of the self-righteous Jews who held to their knowledge of the law as proof of their superiority over others? If this is the case, we stand in just as much jeopardy as they did, and we are on the verge of being rejected by God. And once again, I... I I go back to the 29 teachings, the doctrine of the church. It's good. It's important. But simply claiming 
ownership of the doctrine of the church does not make us righteous, does not make us holy. Simply claiming that since we've been granted knowledge of the truth does not make us perfect in the eyes of God. This is precisely the failure of the Jews. They had been given the law, yet they failed to live up to the law, but rather boasted themselves in their possession of the law, in their knowledge of the law. As I say, the doctrine of the church is sound. But possessing the doctrine and living by the spirit of the doctrine are two very different things. And if we can't distinguish between the two, we will be rejected just as the Jews were. Back in the commentary, he concludes his instruction to the Gentiles with an admonition to give serious and sober consideration to both the goodness and severity of God. The severity of His wrath and judgments on unbelieving Israel, the goodness which He extended to the believing Gentiles and to all who would continue in His goodness and to all who would believe the gospel. At this present time, God is working with and through His church, which He so loved that He gave His Son, who in turn so loved it that He gave Himself for it, purchasing it with His own blood. He sanctifies and cleanses it with a washing of water by the Word. Soon He will present it to Himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but holy and without blemish. Now the church will be perfected according to God's Word and will. But the question of, of it will be, I'm sorry, but the question of if we will be a part of it remains up to us as individuals. Simply having one's name on the rolls does not assure entrance. This was the failure of the Jews. They believed that since they were a part of God's chosen nation, their acceptance was without question. Claiming a knowledge of the law could not save them when their lives did not represent God as He had intended. Knowing the doctrine will save no one in the end. What counts with God is our faithfulness. Faithfulness is more than a simple head knowledge of the truth. Faithfulness is deeper than reciting the words that we've heard. Faithfulness is allowing God the freedom to work through us in such a way that souls are drawn to the truth, drawn to the truth, not chased from the truth. We have a choice. We can either be surrendered to God or we can reject Him. Listen to the words of Jesus in Luke 6, 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Matthew 7, 23. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These words, and many like them, were spoken to those who considered themselves to be among the spiritual elite of their day. Yet they were rejected because their actions did not line up with their profession. In their day, they were the spots and wrinkles which were removed. They are our examples of what not to do. Spots and wrinkles remain today. It's up to us to make sure that we're not among them. We need to be open to be able to see our shortcomings so that we can allow God to cleanse us and prepare us for Jesus' return. The church will be taken up in the rapture to be forever with the Lord. Following the great tribulation and the battle of Armageddon, the church will rule and reign with Christ on earth a thousand years. Golden Truth, Acts 28, 28. 
be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and they will hear it. As I read this, I, 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 I can't help but go back to some of the things that have been brought up in previous lessons and how this, this applies as much to us today as it did to the Jews. These words were spoken to in the beginning. I think this could be easily rewritten for our own day with a single change of one word. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation is God, of God is sent unto sinners and they will hear it. These words were spoken basically in condemnation of the Jews who are granted the, the blessing of being counted as the chosen of God. Now I've heard my entire church life that we are, as the church, the chosen of God. That being the case, this verse of Scripture is just as much for us as it was for them. We need to be clear. We need to be able to see the failures of those, of those Jews who refused to submit themselves to God in ignorance. They thought they were doing God's will. I mean, that's, that's why we have Romans in the first place. Well, who was it that wrote Romans? It was Paul. Who was Paul? But one who persecuted the church and did his best to destroy it. Why? Did he just not like the people? No. He thought the people were going against God's will. He thought he, he himself in his destruction of the church was doing God's will. We need to see how we fit in there today. What are we doing? No, we're, we, may, we may not be persecuting uh, Christians today. We, we may not be uh, beating and beheading and throwing into jail and uh, such those who are seeking the Lord? But are we striving as we should to reach out to the lost, to be a blessing to them? Or are we condemning the lost just like the Jews did in their day? Yes, absolutely. back to the Jews and mentioning that um, they disobeyed God at certain times. They were His chosen people mm -hmm. and they disobeyed God. Right. And we just recently were on the fence of the series that we're watching about Anne Frank. Right. And the things that happened in the Holocaust. And of course, you know, you hear it, but then when you see it, and I believe that National Geographic series brought about probably exactly what Mm -hmm. And but we have to remember that the Jews were God's chosen people. They disobeyed God, and ultimately we see what happened in the Holocaust. And my thinking is, we are God's chosen people now. Mm -hmm. God's taught us to, or told us to love one another. Right. He's wanting, just like we are, the church to go into perfection. We are the bride of Christ. But are we following that? We, we need to be prepared. We, we need to be prepared for the consequences of our actions. And to the disciples, and many of them were persecuted. <laughs> All but one of them was killed. Um, they tried hard to do kill him. <laughs> Jesus was put on a cross. Right. What makes us any different? Exactly. And there's so many that teach about Mm. But we better watch it. Right. But what does history say? Yeah. What does history say? Right. I totally. Are we are we more privileged than God's chosen people to Right. Be? 
Right. Only more privileged than Paul, John the Baptist. These, these are critical things that we need to consider when we look at God's Word. And I think, uh, like you said, it's not precisely on topic, but I, I agree with you that something we need to do as we read God's Word is allow the Spirit to lead us. The words of those who have come before us are important. The, the, the knowledge that they've gleaned, that they've dug out from God's Word is important. But any time we go into the Word of God seeking to receive what we already know, we can't allow the Spirit to lead us fully as He would. We have to go into the Word of God with an open heart and an open mind, ready to receive the understanding that God has for us. How is it that those who have gone before us, as you said, how is it that those who have gone before us have gotten the information that they received? Did they just assume it from the previous generation? We're, talk, we're doing the, the big uh, solemn assembly push right now, looking back at those days. How did they get that information that they had that, that we enjoy today? Did, did God just dump it on them and say, oh, here, you need to know this. Oh, here, you need to know this. No. I, I can't remember where I read it, but I read that they, it was a metaphor, it was poetic speech, but they said they, they crawled on their hands and knees in search of the truth. They didn't truly crawl on their hands and knees. It's a metaphor, but they dug it out. They sought it out. And how did they do that? By looking into the Word of God with unbiased eyes, with an unbiased heart, with an unbiased mind. Say, Lord, I know what those who have come before me have said, but I want to know what you would have me to know about this passage, what you would have me to know about your word, what you would have me to know about your will. And once again, those who have gone before us, many of them have, have dug out important truths. And we, as, as Christians today, we can look back at the history of Bible study, basically, and we can see. We can see clearly where those who have dug out the truth have found the truth. And because of the knowledge that we have, we can also look back and, and see those, some of those same scholars, some of those same theologians have gotten it wrong. But we've seen more of the truth since then. We've been given a revelation that's deeper since then. Simply having someone who wrote something 200 years ago doesn't make it more true than something that was written yesterday. It's about recognizing the Spirit, the Spirit of God, not the Spirit of deception, not the Spirit of division, but the Spirit of God in His Word and allowing Him to lead us into a deeper understanding of the truth. If, if, we, if we intend to achieve the fullness of the Gentiles, as this lesson is speaking of, what that means is we have to be open to receive more. We're not full. The times of the Gentiles aren't full, and we are not full, so full of the truth that there's no more for us to learn in order for us to receive that fullness, we have to be willing, open and willing to accept what God would have us to. And the only way that that's going to happen is by looking at God's Word in an unbiased manner, in seeking the depth of what God would have for us. Not... not basing it on what others have said in the past, but looking at it fully through the Spirit of God. The old cliche says those who uh, don't learn from history don't learn from history. Right. Uh, Chelsea was a history major in college. Uh, but all the studying that she did, everything that she read in history, mm -hmm. <clears throat> still does not do anything to benefit her. Day, right. unless she applied it. 
Right. <clears throat> the same thing about the Word of God is it's great to read the Word of God. Mm -hmm. It's great for us to look back at the accounts. It, 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 gives us, it gives us a great account, a great feeling of confidence in God. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if all we do is read it as what has happened in the past, right. it's nothing more than a book of fairy tales to us. Right. But if we'll take it and we'll apply it to our lives in the present day, and say, God, what can I take from, from this scripture to help me now? Right. We can see the word of God open up to us in such a way that it will give us the strength we need to carry on in every instance of life. So we're, <clears throat> we're still talking about the times and the fullness of the Gentiles here. Right. Once again, it is my desire to receive the fullness of God's word. I appreciate those who have gone before me. Uh, I, there, are, there are so many faithful servants, uh, not only in the church, but prior to the rise shine of the church. There are so many in other, well, so many in the denominational world today, right now, who are seeking a deeper understanding of the truth. <clears throat> we need to be able to see what God would have us to see. Not only in ourselves, but in the fullness of His will for His people. And we all know that there are, th there are times, there are individuals who, who have written such powerful and important information concerning God's work. Uh, I, I love Spurgeon. Spurgeon's a, a, an amazing minister. He, he truly sought God's will, and, and it's obvious by the things that he's written. But we also know that he had some ideas that were far from the truth. It's not that he was deceived. That was, that was the light that he had available to walk in at the time. <clears throat> he wasn't out to confuse people. And we understand when we look at his writings that there are some things that we have to look over. There's so, there so much more for God to reveal to us from His Word in order to us, for us to fulfill His will here on this land and allow this, the fullness of the Gentiles to take place in us. What was the, the main failure of the Jews? When I look back, what I see in them, what I see, we're talking about history, Talking about the, still talking about the fullness of the Gentiles. <clears throat> what they did was they had the law. God gave them Ten Commandments. Out of those Ten Commandments, they made 613. So there are 613 laws that the Jews live by to this day. The problem to this day is they believe within those 613 law, laws lies the fullness of God. They have contained the fullness of God in a box of 613 laws. There's nothing more that can be added to that box because the box is full. It's complete. There's nothing else. If you study it out, you'll see that this is exactly what happened. So then when Jesus came along, it didn't, He didn't fit in their box. And so he had to be a false prophet. He had to be a deceiver. He had to be someone who's trying to confuse the people. He didn't fit in the box. <clears throat> Today, <laughs> we have 29 laws. But we can't allow those 29 laws to deceive us into believing that that's the fullness of God's will. Now, I'm not talking about changing things that are established. I'm not talking about new light that destroys what God has already revealed. I'm talking about more of what God would have for His people to receive. Just as, just as the Israelite, the Jews rejected Jesus, are we rejecting more of the truth because we have God in a box today?
Because if we have God in a box today, then we are no different from the, the Jews. Not the Jews of Jesus' time, not the Jews of today. We are no different. We're just another organization who has God in a box and nothing can get up, make us any better than what we are right now. We've already been perfected. We're waiting on everybody else to catch up. And if that's where we are, what Wendy was talking about is exactly what's coming on us because we've rejected the truth. The truth is we've not received the fullness. We've not uh, achieved the fullness of the times of the Gentiles as this lesson speaks of. There is more for God to reveal to His people. But as long as we keep Him in that box and say there's nothing else, we're lost. We're just as lost as any Jew. You come to church every time the doors are open and praise the Lord, sing and shout worship. But if God's in a box in your life, you're lost. Straight up, you're lost. You are not saved. Salvation will cause us to hunger for more of God and not be satisfied with what we have. In this world today, there's a, there is a hunger for more stuff, but a sufficiency in our lives for the things of God. I have enough of God, but I need more things. We need to have the opposite attitude if we are going to be found faithful to God. I have enough things. The stuff that I had supply has is, is sufficient for my needs. But I don't have enough God. I need more God. We should never be satisfied with our spiritual condition. Ever. Now, looking back at Paul, talking about the book of Romans here. Where, what did he say? He, about, he said, not that I were perfect, but I pressed toward the mark. We look at the life of Paul. We see the ministry of Paul. We see the extent to which he went to try to win the lost. And he said, I'm not perfect. And I can't, I can't help but go back to that thought. How can we look at the life of Paul and think of ourselves as more uh, spiritually advanced than he was? We need more of God. Get in the commentary here. Let's the times of, of the Gentiles. Yes. I thank the Lord for His mercy. And what a change that the Apostle Paul experienced. Un hombre que era conocedor de la ley. A man who was knowledgeable <coughs> of the law. De, de los mandamientos. Who was knowledgeable of the, man, of the commandments. Y también era hacedor. And he was also a doer. Pero no bastaba solamente con conocer lo que es la ley. But it wasn't just enough to know the law. Sino que, uh, <coughs> bueno, todos sabemos y lo hemos leído a través de la escritura. And we know and we all know and have read in the scripture. Como él este uh, lo que él hizo en contra de la iglesia en nuestro tiempo. What he did against the church. Hubiera sido lo contrario, ¿verdad? It, it, we would have loved for him to have been the opposite. Como conocedor de la ley. As a knower of the law of the law. Cuando vino el Mesías. When the Messiah came. Él se hubiera unido, ¿verdad? Para para trabajar este uh, a favor de él. He could have been able to, to work together uh, in his favor. Pero no surge eso. But that's not what happened. Uh, bueno, el punto es porque había en su corazón algo. But, but the point is, is that there was something in his heart. Que la ley no lo, pudo, no lo podía cambiar. That the law couldn't change. Right. Tuvo que este, enfrentarse, aparecerse del Señor Jesucristo en persona. The Lord Jesus had to appear to him personally. Y conocemos esa parte. And we know the story. Pero ahora. 
Lo interesante es cuando él tiene ese encuentro con el Señor Jesucristo. ¿Qué es lo que sucede con él? Bueno, Dios lo, lo salva. Lo bautiza. Con el bautismo del Espíritu Santo. Pero después de eso, la Biblia registra que él se va por un tiempo al desierto. Y es ahí donde él recibe la, la revelación. That's where he the por eso él dice, and that's why he says, yo no recibí la revelación por hombre. That's why he said I didn't mm -hmm. revelation from man. Porque right. el que estuvo con él en ese desierto Because the one that was there with him in that desert, fue Cristo. It was Jesus Christ. Right. Para enseñarle to teach him el programa the program que Dios tenía para con los gentiles. That God had for the Gentiles. Por right. eso él dice, yo soy apóstol y maestro de los gentiles. And that's why he said I'm apostle and teacher of the Gentiles. Y es algo muy interesante. And it's interesting. Cuando él when he tiene por todos esos años que estuvo en el desierto. All those years he was in the desert. Y recibe toda la revelación. And he receives all the revelation. Ahora se da cuenta. Now he realizes que lo que estaba viviendo a través de la ley no era lo todo was not up, was not uh -huh. que necesitaba tener ese encuentro y aceptar al Señor Jesucristo me llama la atención y me bendice este, en gran manera esa parte and, and, and notice, porque si yo if I, no me dispongo if I don't avail myself a tener ese encuentro con el Señor Jesucristo to have that encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ sabe que voy a estar contendiendo con usted you know I'm going to be um, striving with you ¿Entiende? we're going to be at odds yeah. Por eso necesitamos, hermano, and that's why we need individually tener ese con to have that right. encounter with Christ mm -hmm. hay algo muy hermoso hermano Dios últimamente nos ha estado predicando a través de nuestros Ministros. And recently, the Lord has been uh, preaching <coughs> to us through the ministry. Mensajes muy, muy específicos. It's more, very specific messages. Sabe que los discípulos anduvieron con el Señor Jesucristo. And you know that the disciples walked with Jesus Christ. Pero había muchas cosas que no los entendían. But there were a lot of things they right. didn't understand. Right. Sabe que vemos a través de, de las escrituras. And we see through the scriptures. Que eran multitudes que seguían al Señor Jesucristo. That there were multitudes that followed Jesus Christ. Pero sucedía que cuando los despedía But whenever he dismissed them, y estaban a solas, and that they, and this, and he was, uh, they were by themselves, ellos, ellos querían entender más. They wanted to understand more. Querían entender los misterios. The mysteries. Right. Querían obtener la revelación. And have the revelation. ¿Qué le decían a ellos a él? And what did they say to him? Maestro. Well, the disciple said to him, Master. Decláranos esto. Help us understand mm -hmm. this. Right. Entonces, y esa actitud, hermano, es la que debemos de tener nosotros. And we should have that same attitude para poder ser de bendición. to be able to be a blessing. Porque si no vamos a caer en un espíritu de crisis. Because otherwise we'll fall into a spirit of crisis. Lo que Dios le ha dado, hermano, a la iglesia. God has given to the church. A él le ha parecido bien. That's what he has considered to be good. Entonces, y si a Dios le ha, le ha parecido bien. Hermano, and if it has been good, uh, if it's been good to God. Dale la 29 enseñanzas. To give the 29 teachings. No son las todas. Not all. That's not everything. Pero son prominentes. But they are prominent. Si a Dios le ha parecido, hermano, dale los consejos. Hermano. And if it has pleased God to give the advice to members. Digo yo, ¿quién soy yo para oponer? I say, who am I to oppose them? Ahora. Si lo veo espiritualmente. If I see them spiritually. Pero si right. lo veo en la carne. But if I see them in the flesh. Voy a estar contendiendo. I'll be contending or right. at odds. Porque es diferente cuando Dios a usted le da la revelación. Because it's one thing when God gives the revelation. Pero si yo no tengo la revelación. But if I don't have the revelation. Es ahí donde vamos a tener. That's where we'll have problems. Me, eh, me llama la atención este como <coughs> el escritor de la, de la, de esta clase de la epístola de, 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 de los romanos. And I notice how the author of these lessons. Dios le ha dado este para escribirlo. God has given to him to be able to write them. Y Dios siga bendiciendo a nuestros maestros que están escribiendo para la escuela dominical. God, may God continue to bless the writers of the uh, Sunday school lessons that we have. Porque sí, si, porque sí, si, sí si, si necesitamos. Hermano. Because we still need them. Necesitamos. Y, y hay algo muy hermoso, hermano, de que uh, claro está, hermano, que Cristo. Eh, uh, él, él declaró a través de, 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 de su palabra word, <coughs> todo lo que le iba a pasar a Israel. Everything that was going to happen at Israel, yeah. with Israel. ¿Por qué? Por el rechazo. Why? Because of their rejection. Por el, por el endurecimiento de Israel. Because of their hardness. Uh -huh. Entonces ahora 
Todo esto tenía que tener cumplimiento. Ya Cristo, Cristo el vino y cumplió la ley. So now it all had to have fulfillment. Christ came and fulfilled the law. Dentro de la ley ya Dios ya había profetizado a través de los profetas. And through the prophets it had been prophesied. Que los iba a provocar a celo. That he was going to provoke them to jealousy. Pero Cristo no 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 este canceló eso. But uh, Jesus didn't just cancel that. Porque uh, a través de esta de esta de esta de estas clases. Because through these classes. Eh, estamos viendo este parte de la historia. We're seeing a part of history. Que después de los 70 años después de Cristo. That after 70 years after Christ. Cómo tiene el cumplimiento. How it, how it had fulfillment. Cuando eh, el imperio romano. How the Roman Empire. Entra a Jerusalén. Came to Jerusalem. Y lleva en cautividad. And took them into captivity. Mm -hmm. Ya se había dado el último sacrificio. And they already given, made the last sacrifice. Pero se da cuenta. But now they realize. Lo que Dios habló, hermano. What God had spoken. Cómo tiene cumplimiento. How it is fulfilled. Entonces ahora, en conclusión. Si yo no me someto, hermano, a la palabra. So if I don't submit to the word. Dios no va a estar cumpliendo conmigo. God's not going to be striving with me. Right. No, hermano. Así es. Entonces tenemos que sujetarnos. So we have to submit ourselves to the word. Es algo muy hermoso, hermano, como, como este, eh, Dios nos enseña a través del apóstol Pablo. And it is wonderful how the, how the Lord teaches us through the apostle Paul. Y él sí, él sí luchó, hermano, hasta el final. And he, he fought till the end. Y obtuvo, ha obtenido la corona. And he has obtained his crown. Y de igual manera nosotros también, hermano, si permanecemos. And same, we will also, if we uh, remain. Pero busquemos ese espíritu. But we have to seek right. that spirit. Con el cual está bien. With, that we can walk in. It's so important mm -hmm. that we recognize our need for more of God and never believe that we have everything. The moment we believe we have everything is the moment the enemy has us deceived and we're lost. Sometimes uh, there have been people that God has revealed deeper thoughts like the mysteries of, of the Word they go to preach it and they're, they're looked on as, as Christ was looked on. Exactly. It's, it's not fit in the box. Right. It's not a, of our 29. Right. So you, you, you think you have new life. You know, who are you that, to bring this new life? But God can reveal the mystery to any one of us. Absolutely. You know, we're, we're, <clears throat> we're God called ministers and, and he didn't call many noble, righteous people, right? Right. He called the simple and the you know humble. Right. And God can reveal deeper things to somebody, but instead of just rejecting it because it doesn't fit in the box, we need to, you know, maybe, okay, let's let's search this search out. Search it let's, out. Let's pray over this, just like they did the rest of the 29. Exactly. But yet they're just cut off, man, and, and mm -hmm. their licenses That's... are taken away. Right. They're, uh, you know, they, but if, if we had crosses, they'd probably crucify them. Well, that, that's uh, that's uh, it's critical for us to understand our need to study it out. I can't tell you how many ministers I've heard say it, and and I I know I've said it myself. Don't take my word for it. Uh, I feel like God's given me this this that I'm bringing across, but don't take my word for it. Study it out, dig it out. If it runs if it runs through the Bible like a river, creeks go into a river. Mm -hmm. It's got to be of God, right? Right, exactly. If if it's of God, it'll it'll be found. And if it's not, I need to know so that I can be what God would have me to be. I'm going to try to get a little bit more in here before we close out. Okay. <clears throat> Right, it shouldn't be. <laughs> and yet, we're not even grasping that. Right, that's old light. How can God give us anything else until we grab a hold of that? That's that's important. That's that's a critical thought we need to understand. If if it's so important that God has repeatedly told us that He has to teach us to love, how many other things has God repeated over the years that that anybody can remember? I mean, I know God's spoken to us through the years, but how many times has He repeated, He must teach us how to love? If we don't have that down, as Wendy said, we will never get anything else right. We'll never be able to understand why it is that we need to dig out deeper. We'll, we'll, can, that's, the Jews had lost their love. They lost the love of God. 
and by extension, they lost the love of lost. Let me try to get some more in here real quick. Uh, skipping ahead, just this last last part of this paragraph in this section. Uh, not very long. Anyway, therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to the nation, to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Matthew 21, 42 and 43. Now, bringing forth the fruits thereof. This is the most important part of this passage of Scripture. In the parable that brought forth this response, the farmers who represented the Jews refused to submit the fruit of their labors to the owner. They were making the effort to look like they were faithful farmers, but they refused to submit to the requirements of the owner of the land. This disqualified them from receiving any benefits for their continuing labors. This account was for our benefit. We don't, want, we don't have to miss out. We can take their failure and turn it for our benefit. It will require more than simply looking the part. We must also submit ourselves to that landowner. Only then will, be the nation, will we be the nation that Jesus described where He said, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Speaking of the Jews, and who's He going to give it to? He's going to give it to the nation that brings forth the fruit thereof. Where are they bringing that fruit? In submission to the landowner. We'll skip ahead. God's covenant with Abraham promised that He would make of Abraham a great nation, but also in him would all the families of the earth be blessed. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Genesis 17 and 4. Just as a point of interest here, when, when we see the word nations in the Old Testament, it's the exact same word in Greek as Gentiles. Skipping down the next paragraph, it's clear that we are currently living in the times of the Gentiles, and in all probability, they were very near that, it, and in all probability, very near the time when they shall be fulfilled. This being so, now is a time to prepare ourselves by our full submission to God. The Jews were convinced that they were doing the right thing by their outward observance of the law, by crucifying Jesus, and by their persecution of the Christians. If we become convinced that we are right when we're actually coming short, just as the Jews were, we run the same risk of rejection. Our adversary is skilled in his work. He knows just how to keep us on the edge of God's will. He doesn't have to convince us to go off the deep end. All he has to do is convince us that we're doing enough when in fact we're only just short of reaching the goal. This is why it's so important for us to walk circumspectly as, as Paul instructs. The time is quickly drawing to a close. It's high time for us to be prepared. Any other comments before we close out here? We all need to understand that we are in the times of the Gentiles, without a doubt. If there's, if there's anything else that we're certain of in God's Word, I think we're certain of that. And many have, many have said, well, why is God delaying His coming? Why doesn't He just come back? Because of His great mercy. He, but that... That's, that, that's a key verse in the entire Bible. God is not willing that any should perish. It's not His will, but that all should come to repentance. Now, that doesn't mean that any, everybody's going to be saved. But He's giving us every opportunity to get it right. He wants us to do His will. He, he's pulling for us. You can do it. He wants us to make it. Not only those of us who are in this building, but those of us who are at their jobs right now. Those who are sitting in their houses. Those who, who have no desire for the will of God. Those who are working heavily against the will of God. It's not His will that they should perish. Those in prison. I know that there is... 
there is heavy uh, disunity. That's not the word. conflict concerning uh, all things presidential, all things political. But the fact is, Jesus doesn't want Biden to die unsaved any more than he doesn't want Trump to die unsaved. God is not willing that any should perish. The same God, the same God who sent his son to die on the cross for me, died on the cross for Adolf Hitler, died on the cross for Judas Iscariot, died on the cross for Osama bin Laden, for Barack Obama, for Donald Trump, for Joe Biden, for any other political figure that you can, you can hate, for any other, uh, anybody, for your worst enemy, if you have one, Jesus died for them. We need to recognize that the fullness of the Gentiles, we are responsible. We are responsible to do our part. I, I can't do any of your part. Each of us have a specific task that God has intended for us to do during the lifetime that we have available here. Some are at the beginning of that lifetime. Some are closer to the end. Wherever we are at this point, it's time for us to recognize God's will and fulfill our part in the fullness of the Gentiles. Anything else that anyone would like to say before I go ahead and close out? No, and I think if the church doesn't operate in a theocracy, department, you know, correctly, mm -hmm. by the Word of God, how can God reveal and keep her? How can He bring people in if we're not operating as, Absolutely. as God wishes us to operate? Mm -hmm. Can't. We, we, have, we have to be willing to look beyond the truth that's been revealed already. It's important. Everything that God has given us is important for our spiritual well-being up to this point. But there's so much more to be revealed. It's like we're, <clears throat> it's like we're at the, the first course of a 12-course meal. And we're satisfied with the first course. What we've received already of the truth, it's, it's scratching the surface of the fullness that God would have to reveal to us. I want more. The church has lost the fear of God. We we need more. We need more fear of God. We need more knowledge of God. We need more knowledge of His Word. We're talking about fullness here. But in, in what I've seen, we're empty. We, we have the slightest bit of the truth. We have the slightest understanding of the truth, and we feel like we've, we've already arrived. We've not made it yet. I used to say it didn't... And nobody here has heard those gates, uh, the pearly gates shut behind us. Well, you look at God, those pearly gates don't ever shut, so we'll never hear that. But we've not passed through those pearly gates. None of us sitting here today have made it through. So until then, we have the opportunity to grow into the fullness of the Gentiles that God would have for each of us. I mean, there's a word that tell us, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter in. Enter in, that's right. Right. We need to know more.